It is well to be here. It is well to have these sessions as we are today. The thought came to me that it probably would be a better thing for us at this time to probably separate and to go out into the woods and simply have quiet time. Because I'm not quite sure how much more we can receive and being able to process it and do good with it. I would like to begin with these words of scripture which say, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us unto glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. If you all did what I did, I reviewed the program. Because I, I wanted to see who's speaking and what topics are being addressed. I am blessed by the fact that y'all are here today. You know, I don't know, as you, as you looked at today's subject that I'm addressing, you may have thought, that sounds a little bit boring. I should have just taken the kayak and gone out in the water and spent some time on the water. But maybe you didn't look at the program. So the thoughts and the meditations of my heart are on this subject. Living beyond failure. It's a subject that can be very gripping. It can be very touching. It's probably not a subject that hardly anybody here doesn't need. When you think about living beyond failure. So it's a privilege to share today the thoughts and meditations that have come to me. Let us then begin with another question. Do you think it is within the heart of every person to succeed? Do you think that is the way it is? Every person that is born, every person that has lived on earth, it's within their heart to succeed. Is that really how God made us? When it says in the Bible, let us make man in our image, let's make him in our likeness, is that part of the way God made us? He made us to the aspect of we like to succeed. It is true that man is made with the imprint, the handprint of God. So the handprint of God is upon every person that has ever come into the world or ever will come. The handprint of God is on that person. And the way we are made, the way that we function, the way that we desire to live, is the way God intended. He designed it to be that way. You know, when God, he determines something, he determines to do it, he acts, and it's successfully done. God never has a failure. He never has a defeat. God is always successful. For man to succeed, if you succeed in something and I succeed in something, it's satisfying. It's a measure of accomplishment. It's a sense of accomplishment. It doesn't matter what it is whether it's outside, inside, 
But when it's this whole thing about accomplishing, doing something, there's a sense of satisfaction that goes with it. There's a measure of vic victory. Oh, I was able to do it. I could follow through and it's successful. It is quite the opposite of what failure is. This session here today, and again, I wondered. And in my weak, weak prayer, I prayed for y'all. I don't know what it could be that you're suffering with today. But my prayer would be that you will have this take place. And this is our goal for these moments. We want to find hope. We want to find cleansing and a reason to go on. Going on beyond despair. Learning forgiveness and building relationship. And we would go on then. We're going to live the rest of our time. That's all. All of humanity does that. All of us are living the rest of our time. I'd like to begin, and if you don't mind, I want you to participate with me. I'm going to say some Bible names of people who lived in the Bible. You know them, you know of them. But what I want to do is when I say their name, I want you to capture the first thought that comes to your mind, okay? When I say the name, you capture that first thought, and then I want somebody to say what thought you captured, okay? You got it? And there's a reason why we do this. So are you ready? <coughs> the first thought that comes to your mind when I say the word Cain. You got it? All right. What is your first thought? Huh? Abel. Abel. Well, what did you say? Mark. Mark. Oh, okay. All right. Very good. Very good. All right. Pardon? All right. Next name. Do the same thing here. What is your first thought? When I say Peter. Strong. Strong. Deny. Rooster. Rooster. Okay. Next one. Ready? David. Well, you didn't even have to think on that one. No, you did think. Goliath, okay. Anything else? Great king. The last one. Judas. Betrayer. Thief. The question now would be this. Does one act define who a person is? I bring along this book. Beachdale, no, my wife brought it, but I brought it from the motel. The Beachdale Road. Back in 2022, a 17-year-old Amish girl in Lancaster County on a Sunday afternoon, I think it was, she was abducted and she was murdered. This book has to do with that story. It has to do with the man who committed that act. And the thing that people wrestled with People, the family, the, the family of the, of the murderer, the thing that they wrestled with, does this one act define who this man is?
you open your Bible to Genesis chapter 4? We have one verse here um, to look at, and this is Adam and Eve and Cain verse. All right? So in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. In the view of failure, we read verse 1 of the fourth chapter. And I'm speaking to those who know the Bible well enough to know, you know what happened in Genesis 3. You understand the failure that took place. We just read, read a verse that comes now after that. What does this verse tell us? Have you ever thought about the fact that Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare a son, and she says, I have gotten a man from the Lord. After this failure, there was no divorce. Adam and Eve did not divorce. In fact, they have a love relationship after failure. And today we talk about living beyond failure. When there are those times of life when we have come way short of where we know we should be. And Adam and Eve, they failed. And yet I find here, they did not divorce, but there is love relationship. And it says that Adam knew Eve, his wife, and that's just a... Um, the Bible way of saying that they were intimate. They loved each other. They cared for each other. And because of that, there was conception and there was a child that was born. Will you think about Eve's response to having a man-child born? Eve says, I have gotten a man from the Lord. She is not judgmental. She is not critical. She failed, failed miserably. But now she is saying, in re due respect and recognition of Lord God, she says, I have gotten a man from the Lord. She is referring to a fruit of the womb. She is blessing God and she is not critical. She is not judgmental. The course of her life could not be changed. The course was set, could not be changed. But she's living beyond failure. And it seems though, even though the course could not be changed, and even so it is sometimes for us, when there is a failure and the course cannot be changed, even then God is there, and God can still bless, and does bless, and his purposes are fulfilled in spite of faulty vessels. You think of failure, we think of deficiency, we think of neglect, omission, we think of a lack of success. All right, time for another illustration. This piece of paper then shall represent a clean day, or it can be a clean life. But alas, as sometimes it happens, there is some kind of an event that happens in our day, and it's a, small, it's a failure of something, something that has transpired. We wish it wouldn't be there. I wish it could be changed. But this thing, right now, is a focal point for you. As you look at it, it's a focal point. But is it not true that sometimes that something that happens, it begins to become a greater and greater and greater and greater focal point. Oops. Oops. Until it consumes our whole day. Right? You ever had that? One failure, a small failure, a course of something was set. I cannot change it. 
And it matters not whether we are young or old. This is the way life is. It happens. Not long ago, um, I hit a golf ball. All right? So uh, when I hit the golf ball, it didn't go where it was supposed to go. I was, it was actually at home in our yard. I hit the golf ball. And it went high in the air, and it hit the top of the ro- house roof, which was okay. After hitting the house roof, it bounced and came down, and I heard a sound. No, it wasn't a window, and I wasn't sure what it was. It wasn't only until a little time afterwards I realized that bounce, that second bounce, put a dent in our van door. And when I looked at the dent in the van door, it's like, oh my. And we had just gotten the van repaired because of a hitting a deer. And so this was a freshly painted door had all been fixed up and now when I go and I see our van I'm reminded of that blemish if I am not careful that which happened in a little corner can become an all consuming thing and pretty much consumes my whole day I don't know if any of you guys here you like a vehicle with no scratches the paint is perfect Nothing is wrong with it. You're going to have a hard time living that way. You never had one. There was a time when I thought a car should be waxed at least once a month. I mean, you got to wash it every week. And maybe waxing it twice a month or touching it up is quite the thing to do. That is a tough way to live. Let's think about Abel. This child that, was, that came along, that his mother said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Think about Abel. Did you know that he was the first baby on earth? The first baby. Do you know he had a childhood? He lived on earth. He had a childhood. And he had a mother who spoke. I believe Eve spoke well of the Lord. I think she did. It's not recorded, but I think she did. I don't think that she was all the time down at the mouth concerning her failure. Abel was a tiller of the ground. He was a farmer. But he did bring an offering. And that one offering was missing a most important ingredient And because of that missing ingredient, his offering was not accepted by the Lord. And the Lord talked to him. And when Abel's offering was not accepted, he rose up within. He got really upset. And God talked to him and told him about his life. Abel did not respond well. So he rises up again. And he murders his brother. Does one act. Define who a person is. And that is a question that is a very important question. Does one act define who a person is and should it? Now it seems that Abel did not respond well. We know he did not respond well to correction. To correction. His life could have been different, but it wasn't. As we think about um, this subject now, as we continue further, here is now where we begin to try to understand the depth of failure, the hurt, the anguish, and the regret. Failures seemingly happen in two different categories. Category number one is a failure when it's pretty much contained to myself. I just failed.
failed. Now, there may be people that are close to us that may feel uh, something about the fact that we failed. But failure number one is a category where it's just pretty much ourself. The second category is that which affects others. It brings destruction and loss like this right here. That second category is when there's failure. It brings destruction and loss and hurts others. And it hurts and there is something that has happened where even there can be repentance, there can be forgiveness sought, forgiveness granted, except that which has been lost cannot be restored. Examples of failure are, it goes way beyond when there is a ball that is flying and it's like, oh no, and you can't stop it. There's no way you can stop it. You know where it's going. You know at the end will not be good. But failure goes way beyond those things. Failures happen when there is a word spoken that should not be spoken. I should not have done it. But once the word is spoken, it's gone, and it cannot be retrieved. So then if the, the words spoken are in the context of failure, what shall you, you then do? Actions, failures happen. Examples of failure are actions or a lack of actions. It can happen both ways. When there's action and there's failure, or there's no action and there's failure. The opportunity is gone, and I did nothing. But while I had the opportunity, I didn't do what I should have done. When do failures occur? When do failures occur? What's, ha what's happening in our life when failures occur? Failures occur when there's high stress levels. That is when it can happen. When a person is under great deals of stress. When words are spoken, actions can take place. When, and when failures occur. Failures can occur in the category of spiritual perception and understanding. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that there can be failures when a person has a spiritual perception that things should be this way and it is a twisted perception. How can I make this plain? So, what, we have one of our children here, but we have four more children. So in our parenting years, as we were being parents, we're still being parents, but we're also grandparents, if our spiritual perception and understanding is this, that you must, and there's a place for this, understand it, but for, for the sake of illustration, you must dress a certain way, you must do certain things and only certain things this way, and I don't have the perspective, the understanding and the perception that really it doesn't, that in itself is not it's important but I make it the all important thing do you understand what I'm saying ok so my, I'll give you another example I am of Amish background and so I know that for my Amish cousins when they were growing up their parents' perception and understanding was this. When you leave the house, make sure you wear your hat. Okay? If that is our, our perception, we might be failing in the more important things. Failures happen when there's lusts of other things. And the Bible talks about that. When we have lustings for other things. 
And we are not fulfilling the things that we ought to be doing. And when there's these lustings, failings can happen. And then, of course, another reason we fail, and this is a good one. This one lets us off the hook. The weakness of our flesh. I failed because you know the weakness of my flesh. I just don't have the strength. I don't have the wisdom. I, don't, I just don't have, I just, I failed. Well, that kind of lets us off the hook, doesn't it? Well, not necessarily. What should we do when we fail? The responses that people have when there is a failure, when it's something as simple as an oh no ball flight or something simple, people put their heads, put their head in their hands. I failed. Right? What good does that do? It doesn't do any good. But that is a response to failure. Moms and dads, youth, when there's a failure, it's my head in my hands. I failed. The second response to failure is consume with activity. So when we realize that this failure be it, be it at work, be it at home, be it at church, wherever, we can consume ourselves with activity by making ourselves real, real busy. Consume with activity. Or this is what a lot of people do. When they, have, they know they have failed... We don't hear, I don't think, but across society they would. When they fail, they drown it with drugs, with alcohol, and with pleasure. God did not design us to fail. But he knew Adam and Eve would fail. But he was there right the same day, and he's providing for them. Another thing that happens when there's failure is there's a shifting of blame. Rather than take our own personal accountability and responsibility for what happened, there's a shifting of blame. But today we want none of those. What we want to do is we take our failing to God for healing. And that is the thing that is such a wonderful thing, is that we don't have to live in our failures. We can go beyond our failures. And I have in memory in my mind a failure it has been addressed it's been taken care of but it's still I don't have to think real far and long it's still there The message we had just prior to this one that speaks about God and his greatness and his design for mankind, we now think about the fact that as we go through life, there are those times when failures occur. And how does a person go beyond regret? Is it possible? Can a meaningful life be achieved even after such things occur? Consider the depth of the loss and the rebuilding of a relationship. Is it, act, is it absolutely possible? Is it, is it actually possible? When you think about the depth of the loss and the rebuilding of a relationship, is it actually possible to go further? Or is this where I must stop? I'd like to appoint our minds to Romans chapter 3 if you'll find Romans chapter 3 
We find ourselves, and all of humanity finds themselves here in Romans 3, and I'd like to begin reading in verse 10 following. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable, and there is not one, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. Drop down to verse 19. Now we know that what things ever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that even that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall be no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. In verse 21 you have the words, but now, but now the righteousness of God Without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Let us think about a zenith, a high point of the acts of God. We are challenged as we think about the fact that God made something out of nothing. He did. And he could do great wonderful things. And he does great wonderful things. But as you think about the greatness of the acts of God, very, very much at the top, and I don't know, can we say that this is the pinnacle? This is the zenith of the acts of God. And what is the act of God? The act of God is this. We have all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. We are all guilty before God. And is it not true that sometimes, not sometimes, but always, we always wish that these, fa these failures would not have occurred, we wish it would not have occurred, and we can feel so condemned, we can feel so, so weighty, so guilty before God. I wish it would not have happened, but it did. One of the zeniths of the acts of God is this. It says in verse 21, but now, that's right now. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. As we understand our guilt before God, let us also understand the righteousness of God as well. Let us understand what God has designed for mankind when he says, but now... The righteousness of God without the law is manifest. So think about being in a court. Being in a courtroom, being examined. All the details of all, it's all been revealed. And now in this courtroom, it is now declared that I am guilty of that which I'm charged of. I'm guilty of it. And we wish that we could do something. I wish, we wish that oh, if I could only do something. If I could somehow with my hands, I could do something to the person that I have offended and, and where this failure occurred. If I could only do something, it would help me feel better. But that is not possible. Being in a court, examined and found guilty, short of the glory of God. Notice what it says in 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. One of the zeniths of the acts of God is what? He declares just the ungodly. God can, and he does, declares just and righteous in his sight the ungodly. That's a wonderful thing. It's a great wonderful thing. And as I think about this man... Justo was escorted in by two armed officers. 
He wore ankle and hand restraints strained secure to a leather belt. He took a seat next to the public defender. Finally, the judge entered and seated himself in front of the courtroom. We all rose and started the proceedings. The judge spent the first several minutes making sure Justo understood the situation. He asked simple questions such as, do you have any difficulty reading or understanding English? Then he spent several minutes making sure Justo understood the terms of the submitted plea deal and what his sentence would be. Justo had basically agreed to a life sentence without any real possibility of parole. He had avoided the death penalty by taking the officers to the location of Linda's body. He confessed the crime, pleading guilty to kidnapping and homicide charges. He is now in prison. His chance of parole is very, very, very slim because of the sentence that is given to him. Now you think about being in a courtroom, guilty, and a sense being given. And there are those times when likewise we think about being in a courtroom with God. And God is saying, you are guilty. There is a failure. You failed. But then what? Then what? But now, but now, but now God offers. There is presented. An option is offered that doesn't cost a thing. Think about that. Here's an offer. You are guilty, but here's an offer that you can become free, and in my sight, you are justified. You are declared righteous. The words fail me to be able to put into the tense which I would desire to do at this moment. I don't know, have you ever wept with somebody and said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done what I did. And what you did caused great harm, hurt, and pain. And then, before God, taking the option that God offers. And here it is. The option that God offers is that those who believe in Jesus, I extend to them justification. I extend to them a declared righteous state. And that is a most wonderful thing. You know what? Uh, I'd like to finish here in the next little bit. We live with scars. And you know, we don't mind talking about some scars. You know, I, could, I don't mind talking about and, and showing some of my scars. I, I, think, uh, I think maybe the scar here on my thumb comes because of my wife. So I don't mind talking about that scar. Because the day was when she put uh, broken glass in a trash bag. And she didn't tell me. And I take that trash bag to the trash place, and I cut my thumb, and I've got a scar here. I don't mind talking about that scar. It might be, though, that we have scars that we don't want to talk about. We live with scars, and this is where the difficulties lie. And does one act define who a person is? We get back to that again. Does one act define who a person is? You, f you messed up bad, real bad one time. Does that define the rest of your life? No, it need not. God has made provision, and it need not define you for the rest of your life. As we think about kind of 
tying this all together, let's think about embracing our future. All right? Failures are common to life. We have personal things. It's the category of more personal. Then there's also failures where other people are involved. But let's think now about embracing our future. And I'd like to give you, there are two duties that come with embracing our future. Our first duty, according to Philippians 1, 21, for to me to live is Christ. So let's think just about our, first of all, about our first duty. The first duty that we are to do when we wake up in the morning, you wake up every morning, our first duty is to just live. Live. Do you ever think about it? Our first duty is to live. A lot of people, when they have failures, what do they do? They consider suicide. They want to get out of life. They want to bring life to an end. For us, one of the first duty that we face is we are to live. We are to live for the Lord. We are to follow Him. We are to seek the things that honor the Lord. But will you think about the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul who says, and um, I think it gives us a good indication of how we are able to then live beyond failure. And as I find this verse for us, who was before a blasphemer and persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy. Think about waking up in the morning and knowing that I am responsible for separating husbands and wives. Have you ever thought about that? The Apostle Paul could wake up in the morning and he is knowing I am responsible for separating husbands and wives, for parents being in prison and the children being at home. I am responsible for all these people that have died. I have given consent unto their death. The first duty as we embrace our future is to live. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And how do we, how do we fill that first duty? How do we fill this first duty of to live? How am I going to live? I'm going to live by understanding God's grace. To realize that God's provision comes. His offer is by grace. It's not with, tied with money. It's not tied with some kind of activity. Just kind of reminded of... Uh, a person who was, uh, we were, we're waiting at the airport. I'm not sure which airport it was, but we were waiting for our next flight. And the guy, there was a guy sitting close to us, and he was just jabbering away. Just jabbering, 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 jabbering on a phone. And I kind of overheard a little bit of a conversation. And he indicated to me that he's a Catholic person. So he's going to go see the priest when he gets home. Why do you want to go see the priest when you get home? Maybe so you can make confession. How are we going to embrace our future by living? We embrace it by, first of all, understanding God's grace, God's mercy, and his love. God knows I failed. You know I failed. And I know I failed. Embrace God's grace. Understand his grace. His mercy and His love. Our second duty that we are to do as we think about our failures. Okay, so um, I don't know has this message impacted you in any way or not, but the second, the second duty of man when it comes to embracing our future is this. And I use the words from Philippians chapter 3 which is, again, such a good passage. 
because of what it says to us here. I count not myself to have apprehended, brethren, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Our second duty is to forget. I cannot possibly forget. It's in my mind. Well, that's not that kind of forgetting. You may never, never lose the memory of what happened, but we can forget in the sense of to lose out of mind, to kind of neglect where there's healing that has taken place and freedom has been received and I am no longer controlled by that one thing that happened. And I forget it. And I'm moving on. Adam and Eve did not divorce. I do not know what conversations they had. They had a family. One of their children failed. He failed miserably. His life could have been different. Even after he killed his brother, his life could have been different if he would have taken what was offered to him in that dispensation. But he chose not to. And for that reason, if he didn't, we may not see Cain in glory. Our second duty is to what? Allow healing to take place. Sometimes it really hurts. It hurts a lot. You know, when I think about the bump in the van door in comparison to a relationship hurt, it's a great, big, big difference. And allow healing to take place. Where do you do what? You simply come before God and accept what He has said. You know, uh, our mind will tell us these words are true. Our mind will tell us, yeah, these words are true, but my heart, I really struggle to, to live that way, and, and I tend to live this way. That experience that I had is still my experience. God's resource reaches into our soul to give us healing, to bring about restoration, to give us hope and a future. I just wish that every person on the streets of America and across the world, as they realize their life is so beset with failure, marriages are breaking apart, youth group can have breaking apart, doesn't need to be that way. The resources of God are extended to us to do what? To bring about healing, to give us hope and a future. Lord bless you.